We're going to be uh, studying the book of James together for the next several weeks. And uh, so we're hopefully, hoping that you will maybe grab a Bible and read that on your own sometime this week and just kind of get through it. And, and uh, I think it's going to bless everybody. So, well, hey, uh, <clears throat> I was looking at, at uh, a slide to go with our, our uh, sermon this week. And I saw this little kid and I said, that is trouble right there. And so we figured, you know... Uh, we all are going to experience trouble at some time in our life, right? I mean, that's just kind of a given. When you wake up in the day, you just kind of hope it doesn't run into you like a big truck or something. But we all face trouble. And we could all tell stories um, of how trouble has entered into our life. But the fact is, everyone is going to experience trouble at some time in their life. And that's where James is at right here. The, the book of James actually starts there. It says, this letter from James... A slave of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. It is written to Jewish Christians scattered among the nations. Now, right there, that scattered is a word for trouble to the people that he was writing. Because they were, these people were Jewish. And if you were Jewish and you became a Christian, you became a follower of Jesus, you were in trouble. Because your family was not going to like that at all. They had their Hebrew traditions, their Jewish traditions. And if you said, you know, I'm going to abandon this in favor of this you were out. And then the other thing is that they were in the Roman Empire, and in the Roman Empire, the way that you greeted one another was, a Caesar is Lord. And so if you bumped into a Roman citizen and he says, hey, good day to you, brother, uh, Caesar is Lord, you would say, um, no, Jesus is Lord. And they got in big trouble. So they were in trouble no matter where they went with their family or with just society and the people that were around them. Uh, there was a lot of trouble. And the, these people were, were persecuted. I mean, they were killed because they were Christians. And so among the, these people, this is the people that, G, that James is writing to. And he's saying, hey, I know you guys got trouble. But here's what he says to them. He says, greetings. Dear brothers and sisters, whenever trouble comes your way, let it be an opportunity for joy. Hello? I thought you just said trouble, right? How can trouble and joy be on the same page? It just doesn't compute to the average brain, right? Oh, hey, here comes trouble. Great! This is going to be awesome. Um, that's not usually the way that we respond when trouble is approaching. And yet he says, listen, um, whenever trouble starts coming your way, it's an opportunity for joy. For when your faith, that's believing God, is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be strong in character and ready for anything. Now he's just basically saying trouble's going to happen. So when it starts coming, think, wow, this is an opportunity that could create joy because it's an opportunity to trust God, right? To trust God. And so we have these two scenarios. We have trusting God on one hand, and then the other hand, we have what? Do what I want to do. Do what I want to do. Now, one of the benefits of being human is that, uh, is that we have embedded in us this idea of right and wrong, right? Right and wrong. And there is this idea here that this trouble that's coming after us is going to produce a couple of things. It, number one, a trial. Uh, we need to think of it in ways to say, if you want wisdom, hey, I can ask God, right? This trouble is coming. I can ask God. This is what James says. If any of you lacks wisdom, ask God, and he's willing to give you what you need. So it gives us an opportunity to strengthen and purify our trust in God. That's one, right? The other thing is that idea of wrong. We, inside of ourselves, we're tempted to do uh, sin, commit uh, that which is contrary to what God wants us to do. And so we got that angel and that devil on our shoulder, and we're saying, whoa, okay, you know, I know what I should be doing, but uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure, right? Well, James goes on and he says this. He's not going to resent your asking, but when you ask him, be sure that you really expect him to answer. I like that. For a doubtful mind is, an unsettled, is as unsettled of a, as the wave of a sea that's driven and tossed by the wind. People like that should not expect to receive anything from God. They can't even make up their own minds. 
They waver back and forth in everything they do. Now, let's get real for a moment, okay? Deep, deep, deep down, every one of us from the time we were little knows the difference between right and wrong, right? I mean, my three-year-old, when my, my son was three years old, I remember just walking into a room and he had evidently taken some cookies or something that he shouldn't have done. And uh, he had that kind of, you know, three-year-old guilty look on his face, like both hands behind his back and going like, <laughs> you know, looking off into the, into the other side of the world and saying, oh, I'm not going to get caught, right? It's like, oh, you're busted, buddy. But, you know, even at that young age, we know the difference between right and wrong. And so that's, that's basically a gift from the very first sin. What did they eat from? They ate from the tree of the knowledge of what? Good and evil. Good and, evil. and so from that point forward, in our DNA is the ability to know right from wrong. And if we would think about it long enough and hard enough, every dumb decision that we ever made, we knew. We knew. We can, we can make excuses. We can say, well, so-and-so talked me into it. Or well, I wasn't aware. If you take time and you really think it through, deep, deep, deep down, you knew. You understand the difference between right and wrong, right? So there is this understanding we have to get to the aha moment of knowing that we know right from wrong. And the other thing that we have to understand is that as a Christian, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, is actually embedded in our lives so we understand that He is with us. Not only do we have the gift of knowing right and wrong embedded in us, we also have the Holy Spirit saying, hey, hello, listen to what you know to be true. He's there to prompt us, to remind us of the difference between right and wrong. Now the key, as James says here, is that we have to have a real desire to actually believe that God will speak to us, tell us what's right, and that he actually will deliver. Now, I think the idea here is interesting. I mean, it's a sound principle, right? You want to know what's, what's, what's the right thing to do when trouble comes? Ask God. He's more than happy to give you the answer. The Holy Spirit is there to prompt you, and you've got embedded in you the difference between right and wrong, so you should be able to make a good, informed decision, right? But I love what Charles Spurgeon, an old um, a preacher years ago, he said this. He says, uh, discernment is not knowing the difference between right from wrong. It's knowing the difference between right and almost right. Mm -hmm. Okay? In other words, there is this right and wrong. Oh, you know, Satan isn't really dumb. I mean, think about this for a second. If I wanted you to get, get you to do what was wrong, I wouldn't just, you know, present you this alternative that is just so blatantly dumb and out there, you know, that you go like, whoa, come on, that's really out of the bounds. I mean, I would never do that, right? Instead, what he does, he comes right alongside the truth and he just twists it a little bit. Just makes it a, a tiny bit different. It just changes one word, but it's different. And so often, the deception is something that runs parallel with the truth. It sounds so right, so good, but it's not. So we have to be discerning. That's where we have to listen. We have to ask God, help us be discerning. Help us understand what it's really about. Now, let me give you a couple examples, all right? I think that sometimes, maybe too many times, we aren't really asking God for his wisdom. But in reality, we're hoping that we can convince him or ourselves that what we know to be wrong is okay. Right? We say, you know, hey, um, should I forgive so-and-so? I mean, come on, God. This guy is a real rat. I mean, when you created scum, he was below that. He's done some really, really bad things to me and my family. He's really hurt me. Do I have to forgive him? Now, deep down, you know the answer, right? Yeah, even the Bible says you need to forgive people like God has forgiven you. Right? doesn't matter what they've done. You're compelled to forgive. The Bible says if you don't forgive, God can't forgive you. We know that. But we say, but God, you don't understand. I mean, God, you don't get it what this guy did to me. You don't know how they've affected my life. You don't know how they destroyed my family. You don't, God, no, I'm not going there. So now we're hoping that God will go like, oh, wow, yeah, I never thought of it quite that way. You know, you're right, I'm wrong, go ahead. You know, just don't forgive him. 
you know, I don't know if you've ever had that battle with God where, you know, you knew what was right and you didn't want to go there and so you had this conversation trying to convince him that he could validate your decision instead of his way. You say, well, you know, God, uh, um, you know, I, I found, I found this, this guy I really, really like, you know, and he's just like super good looking and he's really, really nice to me and everything. Uh, I know he's not a Christian. I know he doesn't follow you, but uh, and I know your Bible says I'm not supposed to really hook up with people that don't believe in you, but you know, he's really nice. I mean, you know what, if, I, if we really get tight, you know, I could probably, can, you know, witness to him. And then he'd become a Christian, that'd be so cool, right? And you know deep, deep down inside, and the scripture confirms it, you shouldn't go there, right? But what do we do? We get sucked in by our own desire to be accepted, to be loved, to be wanted, to be needed, right? And because of that, we have this battle inside of us, knowing what's right, but choosing what's wrong. And then trying to convince ourselves of that, we go to God, we ask Him to validate our choice, or we go to friends to validate our choice, right? Or, God, you know, um, man, I know that I really can't afford this right now, but it's on sale. And if I don't get it now, the, the bargain's going to be gone, and I'll lose the chance. You know, I mean, I'll never have this opportunity again, God. So, you know, it, it's okay, right? And say, wow, hmm, no, not good. You know, I can look back on every bad decision I've ever made. And if I think long enough and hard enough, the decision that was made that was bad was me. I mean, God didn't lead me down that path. I chose that path. And I even tried to validate it and argue my, my case before God and my friends as to why I should do it. Matter of fact, sometimes I gathered other, quote, Christian friends around me to join in the fun. That was wrong. And we all knew it. We all knew it. And yet we did it, right? Well, you know, so James is really getting at the heart of life here. And he says, now there is a problem here with wisdom and that wisdom is this idea that I need to know the right thing to do. Well, God says wisdom is available. It's embedded in your DNA. It's embedded in you if you're a Christian. The Holy Spirit is there to remind you. And if you allow yourself to, to really ponder it for a moment, you've got the right decision, right? I'm, I'm convinced that the reason why so many Christians are lacking so much joy is because they're not choosing to follow God's way, the way that they know they should go. So many times, we're at the brink of a decision and you wonder, wow, oh, should I do that? Oh, I know I shouldn't. Oh, I really want to. And we go ahead and then we wonder why we don't have joy in our life because we've been going the wrong way, right? Now, there's another arena that trouble comes from, not just the whole wisdom arena, but the one with uh, poverty and wealth. Here's an interesting picture. You know, you've got the wealth on one side and the poverty on the other and a very thin line between. J just a, a fence that's erected. Say, riches here, poverty here. You can go down to Los Angeles and you can stand on one side of the street in the financial district and look on the other side of the street and it is skid row. I mean, there's a line there. Poverty and riches right next to each other. You know, you can call yourself rich or poor, but you're either one or the other. And what we do with that really makes a difference. James says this. He says, believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. But the rich should take pride in their humiliation or low position since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant, its blossoms fall, and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. You know, Jesus emphasized teaching um, on one thing more than any other thing. Can you imagine what it is? It's on money, right? He talked about money uh, in a very interesting way. He said, beware. Beware. Matter of fact, he told a story, he says, it's, it's harder for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God than it is for a camel to be pushed through an eye of a needle. I love that, not actual scale, you know, right? But the, the real portal was this. The ne eye of the needle was the name of a portal in the side of the wall or inside of a larger gate that they made a small opening for the camels to go through, right? And the tradesmen to go through. 
But for the camel to go through that, they had to unburden him. They had to take all of the wealth, all the goods, all the riches that they were carrying on their backs. They had to take them all off and then literally get that camel down on his knees and have him pushed and shuffled through that little opening. It's kind of a metaphor for riches and us. He doesn't say it's impossible for a rich person to go in the, king, in the kingdom of heaven. But what it does say is that it's extremely difficult. What we have to do is we have to realize that, you know, wealth and riches is not what's going to get us into heaven. That's not what life is all about. And we have to humble ourselves. We have to kneel before God in order to make that right, right? When a rich young man came to Jesus and says, what do I have to do to get into the kingdom of heaven? He said, you've got to unburden yourself. He says, take all your riches, everything you own, and sell it and give it to the poor. And it says the young man went away sad because he was very wealthy. In other words, I'm not giving up my stuff to go to heaven. His choice, right? I mean, Jesus gave him the answer, and he wasn't willing to do it. So the trouble with wealth and poverty here is very interesting. Jesus says, where your heart is... Where your treasure is, your heart follows. That's an interesting idea. That where I invest my money, where I spend my money, is where my heart gets tugged. My heart goes right there. Um, I had a time in my life when I uh, had enough money and I thought it would be kind of cool to own a classic 1968 Mustang convertible. All right? It's very cool. I bought it, I took it home, I polished it up. It was a nice running car. My kids loved it. I looked good in it. Um, so did Janice, right? You know, we enjoyed it. But you know what was interesting? I remember the first time I, I drove the car out to like, you know, where I was going someplace to eat or go to a mall or whatever. And I parked that car, of course, far away from all the other cars because I wanted to protect it. But I found myself when I was walking away from the car after I locked it up and stuff, I, I kept looking back. I just want to make sure that nobody was going to steal it. No one's going to touch it. No one's going to mess with my stuff, right? And at that moment, I realized I had a problem. That thing was becoming more important to me than it should. Why? Because I invested a lot of resources in that thing, okay? Now, we do that. Where our, our treasure is, our heart goes there too, you know? It's interesting in the Silicon Valley here with houses starting around $500,000, a half a million bucks for some place to live. It's very easy for our heart to get attached to our stuff. I mean, that's important, right? It's important. And so where we put our money, God says, if you want your heart to go far away from God, great, invest in things that are not godly. But if you want your heart to be drawn toward God, where do you think you should invest your resources? In kingdom stuff, in God stuff, right? It's very interesting. Now, where this becomes tested right at get-go is the issue of tithes and offerings. Now, we just took an offering, right? What's very interesting, if you go to the Bible, this is a, 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 not even a question in the Old Testament. It, it was a regular religious event for people to give at least a minimum of 10% of all of their wealth, all their income to God every year. Okay, whether it was in grain or, you know, or sheep or cows or whatever, they would take a tenth and the first part of their produce or the first, first calves that were born or whatever, and they would give that to God as an offering, a tenth. Now you go to the New Testament and, you, and all of a sudden you see examples like Zacchaeus, who was a tax collector and a thief. And he says, when he accepted Christ as his Savior and his Lord and Master, what he said is, I'm going to return all the stuff that I've stolen. I'm going to give people four times what I stole from them. And then on top of that, from now on, from this day forward, all of my income, I'm going to give 50%, half of what I earn from now on to the poor. And Jesus' response was, today salvation has come to this house. See, Jesus attached finances with our life with God. And he said, you know, if your heart is really toward God, your money will be there. But understand that that's not really the, the, the order that it happens. You've got to make a decision first to give, and then your heart follows. When Janice and I were married, we uh, didn't have much money. We were both still going to school. And uh, together, between the two of us, we made about 250 bucks, okay? This is 1973. We lived in government subsidized housing, $113 rent, right? Uh, we had to pay our telephone bill. We had to pay my insurance for my one car that we had. 
but we hardly ever drove it because we couldn't afford gas, right? And uh, we would pray that our parents would come over to visit because every time they would come, they would bring groceries. You know, come over, visit, <laughs> you know, come see us again. We lived on top ramen and, and you know, dried beans and rice, okay? And, uh, and you know what? We gave 25 bucks a month to our church. People said, how can you do that? You are super poor. But it's not a question of we can. It's, this is what we do. And 10% is like the starting spot. And I, I, get, I get very interesting vibes when I talk to somebody about this. And they say, 10%, well, now, is that net or gross? <laughs> See, you're already fudging. Deep down in your heart, you know the answer to that. Right? I mean, it, it's the whole enchilada. And, and so we, we, we play games. Oh, I'm giving 10%. Well, it's a net, not gross. Yeah. And you go off. It's like, if that's a starting place, where should we be by the time we've been a Christian for 25 years? How about Zacchaeus? 50%? You know, some of us could do that. But we've spent our money on other things. And we have obligations, Right? Well, the way that we have to, to unburden this is what? Through humility. Through saying, admitting to ourselves, we made some bad choices. Um, it starts when you're in college and some guy comes on campus and he offers you a credit card. <laughs> and you sign up and you get a $500 limit. And within two months, you're on the limit. And you're making your $5 a month payments, right? And at that rate, you're going to be paying it off at about 30 years, right? And then you get a, a letter from the, the bank that says, hey, good news, we've increased your credit limit to $1,000. You see, they know you're going to run it up to 1000 now, and you do. And then it's 2000 And then you get another credit card because that credit card won't advance you anymore, right? Then you've got seven credit cards, and none of them work because they're all at the limit. What does that mean? It means that we are living beyond our means. And sometimes it starts with a mental assent to what God wants us to understand, is that He provides what we need. And whether we're poor or whether we're rich, we need to honor God with our wealth. Um, there's an interesting verse in Malachi 3.8. It says, Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? And he says, in tithes and offerings. When we realize that, that you know, when we start thinking that God hasn't given me enough to live on, it's our problem. It's our problem. Because even when we're poor, if we choose to honor God and we write that check first or we give that money first, we'll figure out how to do life with the rest. But if we wait to the end and we say, well, okay, I'll pay all my bills and make all my obligations, and then I'll, what's left I'll give to God, you won't have anything left. I guarantee you. But if you start honoring God and saying, you know, I'm going I'm to start this from the very beginning, and I'm going to give God my first fruits. And, and write that check, the first check, it'll be, you'll be amazed how God provides. And you know what's interesting about this whole thing? Um, Paul writes to a, a group of people that were really poverty-stricken, and, and uh, oh, I love this one. It says, how come the waitress gets 15% and God only gets 10? Yeah, no, okay. But, um, but Paul talks to a church in Macedonia. He says, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the their trial, their overflowing joy, and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Get that? He says, For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. I mean, I, I've never experienced this as a pastor. If we forget to take the offering, somebody run up to me and says, Man, come on, get those buckets out. I, I've got my offering. I want to give it. Right? I mean, we should never have to ask for an offering. There are some churches that don't take offerings. They just have a bucket in the back. And as people come in, they give. Because, see, they're inside they know that's what they want to do. They're compelled to give. They want to give. They want their heart to follow their finances. And so they're making sure their finances go to the right thing. And then he, he winds up, he says, So see to it that you excel in this grace of giving. You don't want to grow as a Christian? Start here. Make it, make it your mission to excel in the grace of giving. Now, what that means is that it's grace. You know? You say, well, those people aren't even grateful. They don't even say thank you. You know what? It's okay. Keep giving. 
Keep giving to what you know is going to support uh, missionary work or, or work with the poor or whatever. You know, our church is really good about giving money outside of ourselves, not just to keep this facility open, but to help poor people around the world. See, that's the idea. Find some place to channel your resources and see that, that God is going to change your heart, okay? So James goes on, he says, Christians who are poor should be glad, for God has honored them. And those who are rich should be glad, for God has humbled them. Now what does that mean, honored, and you're honored by your poverty or you're humbled by your riches? Uh, well, basically it means that God gives the poor the privilege of seeing God provide for your needs. I mean, it was so cool when Janice and I didn't have hardly any money at all, how often God provided when we didn't know where it was going to come from. Remember one time I was a youth pastor in Reedley and we had very little money. We were living in, the, in a church parsonage and stuff. It's a house the church owns. And uh, so we were kind of getting rent-free stuff, but we were barely scraping by. And we had this medical thing come up and we didn't have the money to pay for it. And uh, so anyway, we hear doorbell rings and our kids run to the front door and nobody's there. Well, they go, oh yeah, we have a back doorbell too. So they ran to the back door and opened the door and uh, nobody there, but there's a box, a shoe box on the stoop right there, right? And of course, they opened it up before they got to us and they said, Dad, Mom, look at this. It, the shoe box was filled with $1 bills. I mean, crammed together, so tight you could barely pull them out. You know how much money that was? Exactly to the dollar, the amount of money that we needed to pay the doctors. We sat around the table, we cried, we thanked God. And then our kids got this bright idea. They said, can we do like a ring the doorbell and dash too? You know, if somebody has a need, can we do that for them? And so we started doing that, you know. And they always wanted to do it in $1 bills, you know, <laughs> which was sometimes, sometimes a problem. But, you know, it was so cool that, okay, the joy of being able to receive. We wouldn't have had that joy moment had we not been poor. Right? So, you know, we need to rejoice. There's a blessing that comes. We're honored by our poverty. Now, what does it mean to be humbled by riches? Well, I think we're humbled because we know we don't deserve it. I mean, first and foremost, you have to understand that, uh, you know, you say, well, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. I went to college. I worked hard for my grades. I got a good job. I'm working hard right now. I deserve what I have. This is my money. Well, let me ask you a question. Who created your brain? Who ordained that you would live in the United States where you have the freedom to go to school? I mean, I've often asked God, why wasn't I born in India? How come I was born into a Christian family? How come I am smart enough to get good grades and go to college and go to graduate school and have a good income? I mean, is that all me? No, it's not me at all. I mean, it's just the grace of God. All of it. And so we need to be humbled by understanding that the riches and wealth that we have, God has entrusted to us. Okay? So we need to be humble about that. But then also humble because of the huge responsibility. Jesus says, to those who much is given, can you finish the sentence? How come we all know that? Right? I mean, when God gives you wealth, I mean, consider yourself privileged but consider yourself on guard. I mean, Jesus warns against you being rich because he knows it's a terrible temptation to believe you deserve it. And because we have it, we think we can waste it or we can spend it on our own, own stuff. And we look back and think, how many opportunities have we had that we convinced ourselves, it's okay to buy it because, you know, I got more than enough I need. Well, how come we didn't first think of somebody else who has less? But you know, there's always somebody who has more. There's always somebody who has a bigger toy. There's always somebody who has better things. You know, there's always somebody who has the newest cell phone, right? And we think, oh, well, yeah, I can, I can work that out. When in reality, our heart and our mind, if it follows our, our money trail, then we need to start thinking first about maybe the poor instead of ourselves, right? So we both have a responsibility. I mean, the poor have the temptation because the temptation of the poor is to be angry or to, to covet what they can't afford. And so then they do things in order to get what they shouldn't be getting, what they can't afford to get, right? 
And the rich are tested in this idea. They're, they're tempted to just somehow believe that what they have is all for them and they can use it exactly the way they want. And not to think about the poor because they gave their 10 bucks this last week at church, right? We think that way sometimes. So both rich and poor can be tempted to steal from God with tithes and offerings, right? But the great news is this, okay? Here's the good news. Everyone can pass the test. We all have the opportunity, if we believe deep down we know right from wrong, we have the Holy Spirit that can guide us, if we ask God, He is more than willing to give us the answer, the right answer, right? So what do we have to do? James says we have to do two things. Number one, we have to focus on finishing. He says this, he says, God blesses the people who patiently endure testing, and afterward they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love Him. In other words, he says, you know what? Anything that you could purchase, anything that any vacation you could go on, any place you could live is not ever going to be as good as the finish line. Okay? When we reach the gates of heaven, all of this stuff in the world is just going to, we're going to go like, wow, that was like zero compared to this. So we need to focus on the finish line. Christianity is a marathon, not a sprint. Okay? And so we need to pace ourselves and we need to endure and keep moving toward the direction that we know God calls us to. And then the second thing we need to do is focus on the truth. Just stay firmly focused on what we know to be true. James winds up this way. He says, remember, no one who wants to do wrong should ever say, hey, God is tempting me. Because God never tempts anyone to do wrong and he never tempts anyone else either. Uh, temptation comes from the lure of our own evil desires, he says. Our own evil desires. These evil desires lead to evil actions, and evil actions lead to death. Wow. So don't be misled, dear brothers and sisters. Whatever is good and perfect comes to us from God above, who created all of heaven's lights. Unlike them, he never changes or casts any shifting shadows. You know, his wisdom, his truth doesn't dance around, you know, like we say, well, God, you know, show me what to do. Oh, you know, he doesn't try to keep that wisdom from you. The right thing is there. It's, it's firm. It's solid. It's, it's there for the taking, right? He says, in his goodness, he chose to make us his own children by giving us his true word. Now, that's, that's, a, that's dual, right? The true word is what? Number one, it's God's word, the Bible. And number two, Jesus is the word. Okay? So he's given us Jesus and, and God's word to help guide us in our life. So focus on the future, but focus on the truth. Right now, you, everyone here, has the truth embedded in you. Isn't it interesting that God took even Adam and Eve's original sin and made it into something that could be used for good? Now we know, we don't have to wonder, now we know right from wrong. That's the good part of it, okay? Now we have to believe God that He will give us the wisdom that we need if we ask. We just have to listen. Now, come back next week because here's what's going to happen. If you have a seatbelt, bring it with you because it's going to get hard. It doesn't get easier. It gets harder because, I'll give you a little preview. The truth is out there, right? But if you don't do it, it's for nothing. The church has basically, in recent years, made this big thing out of study the Bible, study the Bible, study the Bible, study the Bible, study the Bible. We, we are all literate. We can read. Christians, most of the Christians throughout the, the his, history were illiterate. They even have the Bible. But we have kind of begun to worship studying the Bible. And we can study and study and study and study and study. And you know what? It's all for naught if we don't do it. Right. right? And so many people get so puffed up and so proud. Man, you look at my Bible. Man, it's all underlined and everything. And I got notes. My pastor, he preaches sermons and I take notes. Man, I, I am so smart. I know so much. Great on you. But if you don't do what it says... It doesn't help, right? It doesn't help. So the truth is there. We have to appropriate it by saying, yes, okay. I'll humble myself. I will do what God calls me to do. And it starts most often with humility. With me simply saying, you know what? I bought that. I shouldn't have. Okay, even if I have to sell it at a loss, I'm going I'm to get my money back so I can do the right thing with it. 
I know I got this relationship going and I know it's wrong. I can break it up. I can tell a person this is wrong. It's going to hurt. It's going to humiliate me. If that's what it takes to do what's right, you got to do what's right, okay? So that's where it starts, is humbling ourselves before God and saying, thank you, God, for the truth. I need to move in that direction and do that. And what does God say? It's for your good. It's ultimately for your good. And it might be hard for the moment. It might mean some enduring, some testing for a season. But ultimately, it's going to result in good for you, for those around you, all right?